Luke chapter 1, 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child, will be born, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Almighty God, as we approach this passage of Scripture, we are reading of things that are, are too wondrous in our human finite minds to comprehend. Lord, we're reading things that it is impossible for sinful hearts to accept unless you are at work in our hearts. Lord, we are confident that through the power of your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, bringing the word to bear in our hearts and bringing these things to our minds, helping us to understand and to apply them and to worship you. We pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you would cause us, Lord, to marvel at the wonders of the Incarnation and to glorify you for the fact that God the Son took on human flesh, lived a perfectly sinless life, died a sinner's death, was raised on the third day, has ascended to the Father, and will return to reign and to rule for all eternity. Lord, help us this morning as we consider these things to receive them as your holy word, and Lord, to respond with worship and adoration to our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you prepared for Christmas? Are you prepared for Christmas? Oh, I wonder what you think I'm asking when I ask that question. Most people are probably thinking somewhere along the lines of, of have you decorated your house? Is your tree up? Have you finished your shopping? Well, people all around us are celebrating Christmas or preparing rather for Christmas in this way. Even unbelieving family, friends, and coworkers are preparing. They're stocking up at the toy store, the jewelry store, the grocery store, and even at the liquor store. That's what it means for them to prepare, but how do you prepare? They celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the Incarnation. They celebrate all kinds of things. We celebrate God, the Son, taking on human flesh. Jesus Christ coming into history to save his people from their sins. A celebration is a very appropriate way to, to, respond, to respond to the incarnation. Listen to the lyrics of Joy to the World by Isaac Watts, one of the best known Christmas carols. And as I said to the kids, you might even hear that in the mall during this Christmas season. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. 
This glorious hymn is based on Psalm 98, as, as Watts put it so artistically, let every heart prepare him room, prepare to receive Christ, not just into the world, but into our very hearts. But here's the thing. Isaac Watts did not write joy to the world as a Christmas carol. He wrote it for the church to celebrate year round. We don't just celebrate the incarnation on Christmas day, we celebrate the incarnation every day, especially every Lord's day. We don't even know when Jesus was born and it's very likely that he wasn't born in December. Nonetheless, Christmas is an opportunity for us to speak to unbelievers around us about Christ. While the name of Christ is even on their lips. Ask them, are you prepared for Christmas? And when they finish telling you about all the things that they are doing to prepare, ask them if their heart is prepared. When God sent Gabriel to, to prepare the aged Zechariah for the fact that his barren wife Elizabeth would give birth to a son, God was breaking 400 years of silence. John was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And now, six months later, Gabriel would again be sent by God, this time to prepare the Virgin Mary to conceive the Messiah. Gabriel was preparing Mary's heart for the incarnation. As we discussed last week, these, these two birth announcements have a lot in common with several Old Testament birth announcements. They involve an angelic messenger, a miraculous conception, and the promise of important deeds done by the one whose birth is announced. But these two birth announcements have much more in common than that. As we saw last week, both announcements take place in four key stages. And again, these will be the, the four main points of this message. This time, the parents are introduced in verses 26 and 27. Then the angel appears in verses 28 to 30. The message is delivered in verses 31 to 33, and the promise is guaranteed in verses 34 to 38. Now, not only do both announcements follow the same outline, but they actually share quite similar language. Zechariah was troubled in verse 12. She was greatly troubled in verse 29. The angel said to him in verse 13. The angel said to her in verse 30. Do not be afraid in verse 13. Do not be afraid in verse 30. And you shall call his name in verse 13. And you shall call his name in verse 31. He will be great in verse 15. And he will be great in verse 32. Now there's more verses than that, but I think you get the picture. Both passages, both birth, birth announcements are remarkably similar. But at each point there's also a striking contrast. The angel goes to a remote village in Galilee versus the temple in Jerusalem. He goes to a peasant versus a priest, to a young woman versus an old man, to the mother versus the father. A virgin conceives versus a barren woman conceiving. A faithful request for an explanation versus a doubting request for a sign. Through both conversations, the angel is used by God to reveal God's redemptive plan through the lives of mere mortals. The lives of John and Jesus are intricately interwoven, and they both play vital roles in God's plan of redemption. But the message of this passage, when you look at it, especially in contrast with the passage before, is that John is great, but Jesus is greater. Taken together, both stories are masterfully narrated, even on a simply literary level. But when we think of what God is doing here, when we think about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, how this is communicated here, it's absolutely glorious. As I was preparing, I found myself full of wonder and worship as I considered afresh who Jesus is. And I pray that the same will be true for you this morning. As we get to know Jesus more intimately here in this passage as we continue our studies through Luke's gospel account. So then let's dive into, into Luke chapter 1, verses 30, 26 to 38. 
This passage that John MacArthur says is the most miraculous, compelling narrative in history as the Holy Spirit reveals the dramatic story of Jesus Christ's birth. J.C. Ra calls this announcement the most marvelous event that ever happened in the world. So first of all, in verses 26 and 27, we see the parents introduced. It is now the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. The angel Gabriel is once again sent by God with an important message, with another birth announcement. But this time, Gabriel isn't going to Jerusalem. He isn't going to the temple. Rather, he's going to a rural town called Nazareth in Galilee, about 100 kilometers north of Jerusalem, as the angel flies. Even though the ESV calls Nazareth a city, it's actually more of a village, probably with no more than a few hundred people. This time, Gabriel isn't going to an aged priest. He's going to a young woman named Mary. And twice we're told that she is a virgin. This is going to be a key detail in the coming dialogue and in, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Mary is betrothed to Joseph, who we're told is a descendant of David. Mary is, Mary's genealogy is also traced back to David, as we'll see in the genealogy in the second half of, of Luke chapter 3. But the descent of Joseph and Mary does not mean that they're royalty. Matthew and Mark tell us that Joseph was a carpenter. And we can see from the context, as we'll see later on, when, when they bring Jesus to the dedication at the temple, they, they bring an offering of, of turtle doves because th this is the offering for poor people. Th these are humble people. And so Mary is betrothed to this, this humble man, this, this carpenter. Now, betrothal means far more than engagement means today. This was a legal agreement before uh, b before witnesses at, after the exchange of a bride price. And, and during this period, the, 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 the woman legally belonged to her husband as wife and was referred to as his wife, but they had no intimate relations during that period. Ending this betrothal relationship would require a certificate of divorce. And generally, after a year-long betrothal, the couple would marry, and, and after a week-long celebration, the husband would take his new bride home. And a woman could be betrothed as young as 12 years old, but, but we really have no idea of what Mary's age was. So Gabriel came to a humble location to humble parents, at least compared to John's parents. Yes, Elizabeth and Zechariah faced childlessness and were scorned because of it, but still Zechariah was a priest. And we're told that Elizabeth was also from a priestly lineage. And so this, this lineage was, was highlighted here. Now, it's not that John the Baptist wasn't humble. He's going to conduct his ministry clothed in, in camel hair and eating locusts and honey. But his human origins were far more prestigious than those of Jesus. J.C. Rao would have us consider the lowly and unassuming manner in which the Savior of mankind came among us. Poverty is not a virtue, and riches are not a vice. But here we see God's glory being displayed in humility. God's power displayed in apparent weakness. 2 Corinthians 8-9, um, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. But of course, the child that was born to the virgin was no mere human. He was, as we'll see, God incarnate. Were God the Son to be born to kingly parents, it would be the, still be the supreme condescension. But instead, he came to poor parents in an obscure town. But our Lord's condescension was Lower still, far lower still, as his life and his death are going to demonstrate. He, as Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 7 and 8, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Now this idea of, of Jesus emptying himself is, is not like what false teachers like Bill Johnson teach. That Jesus emptied himself of his deity. This is so-called canonic theory and it's heresy. It deeply concerns me that Bill Johnson and his, the teaching of, of Bethel Church and those like them are, are, are being embraced by many churches in our city. Jesus Christ was truly God and truly man, as the Chalcedonian Creed from A.D. 451 declares. I'm going to read the Creed later, but, but I just wanted to focus here on this one point. That Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. Now, there are many verses I could refer to, to to emphasize this point, but let me just quote two. Colossians 2.9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And Hebrews 1.3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Friends, without the, the incarnation of God taking on human flesh, the God-man, Jesus Christ, there is no gospel. He who was God and was with God became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 1 and 14. He is Emmanuel, God with us, Isaiah 7, 14. As the infinite, eternal God came into the world, he created physically and within time. And all the while, there was never a moment in which he ceased to be God. It's a profound mystery. But Jesus was still upholding the universe by the word of his power. As Gabriel mentioned, when he was being knit together in his mother's womb. As a baby, as a young boy, as a teenager, as a man on the cross, in the resurrection, in heaven, and in his return, Jesus Christ is continuing to uphold the universe by the word of his power. Now, isn't the Lord's humility and power in his incarnation a glorious and wondrous mystery? Doesn't it cause you to, to, to worship him? more fully for who he is and all that he does. Well, then in verses 28 to 30, we see that the angel appears. Gabriel appears to Mary and says, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, greetings comes from this, the root of the same word for joy. It's, it's a, a formal greeting akin to the ancient hail or to the modern hello. The angel continues referring to her as O favored one. Now the Latin Vulgate wrongly translates this full of grace. This led Pope Pius X to declare Mary as the dispenser of all the gifts that Christ purchased for us by his death and the supreme minister of dispensation of graces, the distributor of the treasures of Christ's merits. Pope Leo XIII declared Mary to be the intermediary through whom is distributed unto us this immense treasure of mercies gathered by God. So Roman Catholics wrongly believe that Mary was sinless. They believe that she was conceived without sin. This is known as the Immaculate Conception. They also believe that she ascended bodily to heaven, victorious over sin. Now, these heretical teachings have led to the corruption of the angel's greeting in the Roman Catholic Ave Maria, the, the, or the Hail Mary prayer. I'm going to take a Hail Mary pass. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I trust that this is the only context in which these words are uttered from this pulpit. We don't to pray to Mary as co-redeemer. And there is no salvation in no one, and there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven among which among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4:12. Mary is not an intermediary, for there is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 5. 
Mary is not a dispenser of grace. Mary was a sinner in need of grace, just like you and me. Mary herself acknowledged that she needed a savior in Luke 147, where she says, my, my spirit rejoice in God my savior. Bishop Joseph Hall declared, the angel greets the virgin, he does not pray to her. He greets her as a saint, he does not pray to her as a goddess. Now at this point in the conversation, Mary did not know what the Lord was going to do in and through her, but she understood that this was no ordinary visitor, and this was not just a simple greeting. Like Zechariah, she was troubled. In fact, where Luke 1.12 says Zechariah was troubled, verse 29 says that Mary was greatly troubled. The angel doesn't worship Mary, and Mary doesn't worship the angel, but she is afraid. It, it's right and it's natural to feel fear in the presence of the holy. But it's, it's not just the, the, the magnitude of Mary's fear compared to Zechariah's, but also the object of Mary's fear that provides a contrast. Look again at, at verse 12. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel. But verse 29 says, Mary was greatly troubled at the saying. It was what Gabriel said that troubled her. And this is before he ever announces anything about, about a conception. And Luke repeats this again for emphasis. He doesn't want us to miss, to miss this. She tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Now, Mary would have known the association of, of the words favored one and the Lord is with you. They're reserved in the scriptures for men like Noah and Moses. They were used in the Old Testament to declare God's gracious calling on the life of an individual to do something extraordinary through them. Similarly, the angel's declaration, the Lord is with you, echoes an Old Testament terminology of God's chosen individual, guaranteeing God's presence and God's protection. And so Mary didn't know what was coming, but, but she knew something big was coming. And so she was afraid. But like he did for Zechariah, the angel calms Mary's fears. Do not be afraid, Mary. However, once again, we see the contrast with Zechariah. Here the angel adds the words that reiterate and emphasize that, that something remarkable is going to happen. You have found favor with God. Mary was exceptionally favored by God. We do not again pray to her. We must not pray to her, but she was chosen by God for this remarkable privilege, not only to bear Jesus in her womb, but to raise Jesus in her home. Like Noah and like Moses, God has chosen Mary to help accomplish his plan of redemption. So next we see in verses 31 to 33, the message delivered. Now this is the, the central part of the passage. Gabriel now tells Mary what is about to take place, telling her not just about the life of her son, but about his ministry, about his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. He, he's telling her how the child that will be in her womb is the fulfillment of the old covenant and the mediator of the new covenant. Now, of course, Mary can't know the full meaning of this from this brief statement, but, but this is going to be worked out in the pages of Luke's gospel and in Acts. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. There is so much here. We'll talk about the conception itself in the next section, but this is the pronouncement of God fulfilling his promise that had been made around 4,000 years prior. Back in Genesis 3.15, the proto euangelion that we talked about so much in Genesis, the first mention of the gospel, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the, the curse of the serpent. This child was going to be in Mary's womb 
is the seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. When the angel came to Zechariah six months prior, the people had been waiting on a word from heaven for 400 years. Well, the people had been waiting for the fulfillment of this promise for 4,000 years. Now, finally, the Messiah, the Christ, is coming. As he did with Zechariah, Gabriel tells Mary that her, her son's name, Jesus. This name, Jesus, means Yahweh saves. Matthew explains further in his gospel account that she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. This of course refers to, to the saving work of Jesus. He, he came to seek and to save the lost, a recurring theme in the book of Luke. The, these cells, they were, being, they were about to be knit together in Mary's womb to, to form bone and flesh and brain synapses and nerve endings were being knit together to fully fulfill the covenant of redemption, to obey all of God's moral law for his people and to suffer and to die as a lawbreaker in the place of his people. When I hear someone use the name of Jesus Christ as a swear word, it feels like I've been punched in the stomach. Just think about what is bubbling out of someone's heart when they use the name Yahweh saves as a swear word. Even though in many cases it's, it's become unconscious, they're revealing the truths of what is happening in their hearts, their hatred of God. A couple of months ago during our series on the Ten Commandments, I, I preached from Exodus 27, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. People use the name of Jesus as a swear word. They're taking his name in vain. And I would argue that, that most people, when they, they say Christmas, when they say Christ Mass, they are also taking the name of the Lord in vain. Because they have no regard or no concern or care at all for who the Christ is. Gabriel continues in verse 32. He will be called great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. He will be great. John the Baptist was great before the Lord. Jesus will be called great and the son, um, will be called the son of the Most High. I don't have words to describe the greatness of Jesus. Philippians 2, 9-11, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the Son of the Most High. These words, Son of the Most High, are synonymous for Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God the Son. Colossians 1.15 He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And 2 Corinthians 4.6 For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. John's greatness was qualified. John was great in God's sight. Jesus' greatness is unqualified. John is great in God's sight, but Jesus is God. But Gabriel isn't finished. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Now this clearly points to the Davidic covenant from 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. Let me read 2 Samuel 17, 12 to 14. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish his throne forever, the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. David had said that, that Lord, I'm going to build you a house. But God said to, to David, no, I'm going to build you a house. And Jesus is the fulfillment of of the promises of the Davidic covenant. This speaks of the, the kingdom rule of the Davidic son. Now Luke is going to come back and, and revisit this, 
theme in, in his gospel account is going to pick up on it again in Acts. That the king is coming and his kingdom is coming with him. But Gabriel still isn't finished. Verse 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob. Now the house of Jacob refers to Israel. This story starts with Israel. This, that Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and to Israel in the Abrahamic covenant. God's promise that, that Abraham's seed would be like the, the sand of the seashore and, and like the stars of the heavens is fulfilled in Jesus. The story starts with Israel, but the story doesn't end with Israel. God's promise to Abraham also includes in Genesis 12, 3, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we as Gentiles are brought into the covenant relationship that God has with his people through Jesus Christ. But still, Gabriel isn't finished. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, now Jews did not fully understand at that time the, the implications of this messianic kingdom. They thought it was going to be temporary. They thought it was going to be physical. And they thought in this immediate context that it was going to be the ousting of the Romans from Israel, and specifically, especially from Jerusalem and from the Temple Mount. But with the incarnation of Christ, we see something infinitely greater. With the incarnation of Christ, we have the inauguration of the kingdom. The kingdom will be fulfilled at Christ's return. Again, another example of the already not yet. And I talked about in our, our series on the model prayer. That's why we still pray, your kingdom come. As D.A. Carson explains, to pray your kingdom come is therefore simultaneously to ask that God's saving royal rule be extended now as people bow in submission to him and already taste the eschatological blessing of salvation and to cry for the consummation of the kingdom. This is Paul's prayer in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Our Lord come. Is echoed in Revelation 22.20. 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So there you have it. In these three verses, a, a profound Christology. John MacArthur says it with breathtaking brevity. On one vast, glorious revelation, Gabriel succinctly summarized the entire ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, his saving work, righteous life, deity, resurrection, ascension, and glorious return. Well, finally, in verses 34 to 38, we have the promise guaranteed. If Mary was greatly troubled before, now she's greatly perplexed. And so she asks, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Well, it said last week that, there was, that, that these two stories had, had in common doubt at the, the revelation of, of what was going to take place. Well, clearly Zechariah doubted, but I don't think doubt is the best way to describe Mary's response. We can see that the, the negative effect of, and the negative slant on what, what Zechariah did because he, he requested a sign. And then we see that, that Gabriel rebuked him and, and Zechariah was in a sense disciplined with silence until the baby was born. Well, there's none of that here. Zechariah had been disbelieving, but Mary was puzzled. Mary was puzzled. She understood Gabriel to mean that she would bear a son without the intervention of a man. Perhaps even that that conception would be immediate. She did not have this perpetual state of virginity as the Roman Catholic Church wrongly asserts. But she wondered how. She didn't doubt if. She wondered how this was going to happen. And so the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Well, first let's look at this phrase, come upon. Luke uses the same term in, in, in Luke 9.34 to speak of the cloud of, of transfiguration coming down on the disciples. Also this idea of, of overshadowing, surrounding, encompassing. 
It's also reflected in Jesus' promise in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the other parts of the earth. And also in Pente at Pentecost in Acts 2, 3, and 4, as divided so tongues of fire appeared to them and rested upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So here we see this, this ministry of the Holy Spirit and God's plan of redemption. We see this we, we, we see that this, this one would be, he would be holy from, from conception. That, that Jesus was the only one who could say, behold, who could not say, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Every other person who has ever existed in all of eternity, well, except for Adam and Eve. And Jesus could say, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He is the only one who is sinless. He was the only one who was not infected by Adam's sin. He was not born like all of us, totally depraved or radically corrupt. Jesus had to be the perfect, holy, sinless Son of God in order to to be the, the, the sacrifice, the only acceptable sacrifice for infinite sin is an infinite sacrifice. And for unholy sin is a holy sacrifice. And Jesus Christ is the only person who was ever fully and completely holy. Now, Jesus re repeatedly refers to himself as the Son of God, which we said, it, it, he is God. The Father also refers to him as the Son of God as, at his baptism and at his, at, his, in our, at his transfiguration. So here we see it in every step. As J.C. Ryle says, in every step of the great work of mankind's redemption, we find special mention made of the work of the Holy Spirit. So another contrast, where we see, we see that that John was, was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And this is, is in a sense, at least in part, a, a, a creation ex nihilo. As Henry Morris, the, the creation uh, scientist, says that, that it is God directly formed a body for the second Adam just as he had for the first Adam from Genesis 2-7. He says this is nothing less than a miracle of creation capable of the accomplishment of accomplishment only by the creator himself. So as God created the heavens and the earth, ex nihilo, out of nothing, the physical body of Jesus was made ex nihilo, not dependent on prior materials. And just as the Holy Spirit was there in Genesis 1-2, hovering over the waters, here we have the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary and coming upon Mary to enable her to conceive this child. It is extremely important, it is vitally important that you understand, as I said earlier, that Jesus Christ, even though he was God incarnate, he is also a man. He is fully God and fully man. This is, is one of the greatest mysteries in all of creation. Let me read for us the, the Chalcedonian Creed from AD 451. Listen carefully. Every phrase is rich with meaning. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men and confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man of a rational soul and body, co-essential with the Father according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, 
one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, the only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning Him, and the Lord Jesus Christ Himself taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers handed down to us. Now, I, I, there's a lot there, but I would, I would encourage you to sit down with your families and to walk through the, the Chalcedonian Creed this afternoon and to, to discuss the, the implications of what this all means. Again, Jesus Christ, truly God and truly man, both at the same time. I think that this is, this is a mystery on par with the Trinity. But again, Mary would not have, have, have at this point understood the implications of, of what was happening. This will be, will be played out and teased out throughout the gospel according to Luke and, and into Acts, the meanings of, 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 what, of what this means, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. But unlike Zechariah, Mary didn't ask for a sign. Nonetheless, the angel condescended to give Mary a sign. Verse 36, And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. Now in the next passage, we're going to see that this first interaction between, between these, these two relatives, the, the, the Virgin Mary and her, her aged relative Elizabeth, and, and the, 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 the baby in the womb, John is going to, to leap when he comes into the presence for the first time of the one who's being knit together in Mary's womb. And so Mary didn't, didn't ask for this sign, but nonetheless, it would have been an encouragement to her. If, if God is able to help Elizabeth conceive, then he can also help me to conceive. And look at verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Mary believed that. She, she believed that, 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 that this was, was able to happen. She, she doesn't question. She accepts. Look, look at verse 30, 38. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord, and let it be to me according to your word. She, she refers to her as the, a humble slave, as a, as a bond servant of God. She's saying, Let, let his will be done. Whatever the cost. And the cost for Mary could have been great. It, it, it very likely would have cost her her reputation. It could have cost her her marriage. In fact, we're, we're told that, that, that when, when Joseph found out that, that she was pregnant, he had a mind to, to put her away quietly. But, but God sent an angel, possibly Gabriel again, who, who spoke to him and told him not to be afraid that that, is within, that which is within her is of the product of the Holy Spirit. The story that she has told you is true. It, it could have cost her reputation. It could have cost her her marriage. It even could have cost her her life. Because remember, at this point, the, the, the punishment for adultery was, was still death by stoning. But she had faith. She trusted that, that God was able to do this within her, that God was able to accomplish this within her, and God was able to protect her through it all. She accepted God's will and determined to be submissive to it. 
And MacArthur says that without regard for the implications of potential risks, Mary faithfully rested in the sovereign purposes of her Savior and God. Mary trusted God. Do you trust God? Do you believe that for nothing will be impossible with God? Do you believe that nothing is impossible for God? You don't have the same calling on your life that Mary did. But do you believe that God is able to accomplish His purposes in your life? God was faithful here. God was, was faithful to, to, to these individuals, to, to Zechariah and Elizabeth and to Mary and Joseph. But, but far more than that, God was faithful to His people. God was faithful to the promises that He had made to the, in, the, in the prophecy under Malachi 400 years earlier. And God was faithful to the promises that He had made to His people 4,000 years earlier. that the seed of the woman would indeed crush the serpent's head. And because of the seed of the woman, because of all that God has fulfilled through the seed of the woman, you can be confident that God will fulfill His promises and His purposes for you. God is almighty. God is the almighty, all-sovereign God. J.C. Ryle said that, that faith has no greater rest, no greater peace than when it rests its head on the pillow of God's omnipotence. Does your faith rest on the pillow of God's omnipotence, that God is faithful to fulfill His promises and to accomplish all that He has said He would do? God is powerfully working to fulfill His plan. His redemptive plan for all people, for, for his, his all people through all time, and for you, His people. John was referred to as, by Jesus as among the greatest of all human beings. But Jesus Christ is infinitely greater than John. In Jesus, we have a Lord. In Jesus, we have a King. In Jesus, we have a Messiah who will rule for all eternity at all points. Jesus is all superior. He can be trusted. You can follow this example that Mary laid out for us in, in faithfully obeying God's call. Again, we don't, we don't worship Mary. The only hero in the Bible is God. But in her obedience, in her, her humble service, Mary provides an example for us. Now we saw that, that God the Son, in, in coming into this, this humble family, in, in this humble town, was condescending Himself. But as we'll see through the Gospel according to Luke, his condescension will be infinitely greater yet as he gives up his life for his people. And God will show his faithfulness yet again as on the third day Jesus rose from the grave victorious over sin, victorious over your sin, victorious over death, victorious over your death, Victorious over hell, over the hell that you deserve. And he's ascended to the right hand of God where he intercedes for us at this very moment. And he will return just as he went up bodily to rule and to reign over his people who is calling to himself. Let's pray together. What a glorious God you are. And what a glorious plan of salvation you have devised, triune God. We marvel as we consider how each member of the Trinity, with one mind and one will, fulfills individual functions for the purpose of redemption, for the glory of your name. We marvel. Heavenly Father, that you would send your Son 
to die for us. Holy Spirit, we marvel that you would apply the work of Jesus Christ, his life and his death and his resurrection to our account so that we might become the righteousness of God. We praise you, Triang God, that you have fulfilled all of your purposes in Christ. And we praise you, Triang God, that you will return in the person of Christ. Lord Jesus, you will return and you will reign. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus. Amen.